Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We've got a few more minutes before we get started. Uh, feel free to go ahead and introduce yourself um, in the comment and in the chat section if you like. We do ask that everyone um, keep their audio on mute. Um, you are more than welcome to utilize your video if you like, um, but do keep your audio on mute. And again, we'll get started in just a few minutes. Hey, Don, thanks for joining us. Also glad to have you here with us, Sean. Good to see you. Um, as we wait for others, I have uh, posted some links um, in the chat section. Unfortunately, it looks like some of them got jumped up a little bit together, but the first um, link is for our May 28th Spring Supplier Diversity Roundtable. The second link is to access more information on the LGBT Business Enterprise Certification. The third link, which is lgbcc.com slash COVID-19, it's just a link to our COVID-19 resource page. And then the final link is a resource from the Small Business Association um, talking about various funding um, resources that are now available. Again, we'll get started in just a couple more minutes. Um, feel free to introduce yourself in the um, chat section um, until we get started. Thank you so much for joining us, Jennifer. Okay, I'm off mute. Good morning, Jeremy. How are you? Pretty good. How are you? Great. All's well, as can be expected, I guess, these days, right? Yes. yes. Thanks so much for joining us. You bet. Uh, just a few more minutes. Thanks for joining us, Patrick. Great to see you. Again, we are also doing this live on Facebook. Um, so if you are following, um, if you are friends with us on Facebook, you're more than welcome to share that, um, that live stream um, with your um, network so that they can also join us and hopefully also get certified. Thanks to those folks who've joined us on Facebook. Um, I see uh, Mike and Joe Morales and, and Lisa. Thanks to all of you for being here with us. So let's see. We're just waiting. Oh, there we go. Let's start in just a second. Done. Fine jury. And thanks for having me. Just saw engine. Oh, there's our awesome engine now. We're going to unmute her. <laughs> she goes. Perfect. Um, so, again, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I know we still have some people coming on, um, so uh, welcome to the chat room, or to the group chat um, as we get started. Again, everyone, we do ask that you keep your audio on mute. 
um, but everyone is more than welcome to um, cut on their video um, for today's chat. Um, again, just a few housekeeping tips. Um, at the bottom of your screen is a section that says chat. Again, you can utilize that function to um, introduce yourself, um, share questions, share comments, and just engage with others as we are going through today's conversation. Um, also at the bottom of that chat screen, um, you will see that there are ways for you to adjust who that message goes to. Um, so if you do want to specifically reach out to someone, have a question for them, um, then do um, adjust it so you're only sending that message or contact directly to that person uh, versus um, sending it into the group. Um, but other than that, I'm super excited again to have everyone here with us. Um, so for those of you who are possibly joining us at the uh, LGBT Chamber of Commerce for the first time, uh, my name is Jeremy Holston. Um, I am the director of our Chamber of Commerce. We are a statewide agency supporting um, the voices of nearly 50,000 LGBTQ business owners across the state of Illinois. Our membership serves uh, 300 members supporting them and anyone who's really interested in marketing, professional development, networking, and advocacy. One of those other pieces that's really valuable is making sure that we connect businesses with the LGBT Business Enterprise Certification, which is where most of today's conversation will focus on. Uh, if you are already certified, or today's is, is, is your first I'm learning about it, um, then you should also know that we are an affiliate of the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce located in Washington, D.C., um, which is the organization responsible for uh, managing the certification, um, uh, managing the application process, and really being the lead voice in all opportunities around certification. Um, again, as an affiliate, um, we are here to assist the National Chamber in uh, education for businesses, outreach to new businesses to be certified, um, and really just also the local piece around corporate um, education and again, educating our um, small business owners as well. Um, we do a good number of activities, um, hosting about 70 events um, throughout the year. Um, again, uh, making sure that we do have the opportunity to also provide um, resources around um, supplier diversity. Um, one exciting thing um, that I love for all of you to know, um, last year, um, Chicago or Illinois ranked fourth in terms of the growth for new certified and businesses to recertify. So yay, thanks for those hand claps. Um, and that, that happened for all of you. So I know a number of you were in those numbers that got recertified. So thanks to all of you for going through that process and really helping us to be a leader in um, and for us in Chicago, that's a really big deal because um, we are at that time, um, and even still technically now, um, we are fourth in a city and state that does not actively recognize LGBT businesses um, in our supplier diversity program. So imagine um, as we continue to make progress, as the city of Chicago um, begins to work with LGBT businesses and the state of Illinois, um, we will hopefully um, jump all the way to the top. So um, with that great success, um, we know how valuable it is to make sure that all those people who are newly certified or thinking about getting certified have access to um, best tips and practices to um, leverage um, that certification. So today's workshop, um, LGBT Now What, um, is our new workshop that we'll be hosting twice throughout this year. Um, to really, again, make sure that everyone has the um, information to be successful um, in that journey. Um, so I'm super excited to have um, two guests with us here today. Uh, our first is Anjanetta Friesen from Barilla, and the other is Ryan. So a huge um, welcome and claps for um, Anjanetta and Ryan. So thank you guys for joining us. Hopefully you guys are unmuted. It looks that way. Um, so um, obviously, so I do have some awesome bios for both of you. Um, but what I think would be great, I'll let you um, share your bio. I'll let you introduce yourself. And then anything that I think is really awesome that you didn't mention, I'll be sure to fill it in. Um, so Ryan, as you are today's LGBTBE 
um, on the box. Um, we're going to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself first um, and really just tell us anything else that you'd like us to know. Great, thanks. Um, thanks all of you for taking your lunch hour with us. Uh, and Janetta, we all should have been eating Barilla pasta today uh, for lunch. So we'll have to do that next time. But um, so I'm Ryan Ruskin. I'm originally from Pittsburgh. I moved to Chicago in the early nineties to go to graduate school at Northwestern, fell in love with the city and have been here ever since. Um, my company's the Ruskin Group. We're in a global sustainable packaging company. Um, and uh, we are still headquartered in Pittsburgh. We have an office here in the Loop uh, distribution center on the, we on the um, far Western suburbs. Uh, and we do some manufacturing locally as well. Um, and uh, in our focus of sustainability um, on all of our packaging that we do, uh, we've been rolling out biodegradable products in, in our plastics programs that actually um, biodegrade and go away. Uh, they don't create microplastics or any um, residual products. So we're still really busy in that space these days at our company. Um, we're piloting straws right now with some of uh, the national uh, restaurant chains that we're hoping is gonna take off pretty quickly uh, and looking at some other things in that space. Um, and we'll talk a little bit today, possibly about uh, the PPE stuff that we're be, that we've switched to a little bit uh, in response to the COVID nineteen uh, crisis that we're experiencing. So um, I live here in the city. I'm at Montrose and uh, the lake, basically, and I uh, live with my partner of 22 and a half years and our two dogs who may pop into the screen every once in a while because they're still adjusting to having us at home too. Uh, we've been certified for about two and a half years and we've been a member of the of the National Chamber for, oh boy, since probably their second or third year in existence. Um, so we've been uh, as part of this experience uh, in supplier diversity for quite a long period of time and it only gets better every day. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, one, uh, one small quick thing to notice that um, Ryan's uh, company, Doroskin Group, is a 126 year old business. So, um, definitely an established business in terms of delivering great quality, great services, and great products. And so, um, really excited about that. Um, another thing that Ryan did not mention is that he is the non executive chairman of My CEO, a sustainability education business he had found help consumers break their habits of disposing of waste that harms the environment. Um, as Ryan uh, mentioned, we've also launched uh, biodegradable plastic products, including straws, bags, bottles, and other containers, um, which is very timely. I was, I, I, like many of you, I just get on YouTube and watch lots of videos. And the one I was just watching yesterday was about the cruise ships and how they dispose of waste and just what that whole journey looks like. So hopefully that'll be another uh, big customer industry for you to happen to uh, down the road there as well. So thank you again for joining us today, Ryan. Thanks. Um, our other uh, guest today um, is Anjanetta Friesen. Uh, for those of you who are longtime members, or at least since last year, um, you will hopefully know that last year Anjanetta was awarded our Supplier Diversity Advocate of the Year Award. So, um, Anjanetta and Barilla have really been great in um, connecting our members to resources, um, championing um, their own opportunities to our members, and really also sharing expertise uh, um, to our certified businesses. And so we're very appreciative and thankful for Anjanetta and Brilla for all the work they do um, to help LGBT businesses and all other communities access um, this information. So uh, Anjanetta, thank you so much for being here with us today. And um, please share uh, your introduction of yourself, whatever you want us to know. Okay. Um, Anjanetta Fryson, uh, I live in the far north suburbs. Um, I have been with Brilla. I just made two years actually. Yay! Congratulations. Um, so I started Belair, like I said, two years ago, and um, it has been a uh, great experience. Um, Barilla established their program, like formally established their program by hiring me. Um, the leadership uh, felt that uh, diversity within our supply chain was important and that in order to show their importance and also to grow the program and get the awareness out there, they needed to dedicate a full-time person to do this. And so I was brought aboard to say, hey, we're serious about this. 
you know, what can we do to kind of uh, move ourselves forward in the space with supplier diversity? So we have been a partner um, with the chamber. I think this is going on year three because there was already a relationship prior to me uh, coming. So um, I wanna thank the chamber and Jeremy for all of the help and support because as you know, trying to stand up a new program um, is, uh, is difficult. So you need uh, cr critical and crucial partnerships that can kind of help you uh, introduce you to and expose you and help you to facilitate and advocate for the suppliers that you're trying to do business with. So the relationship has been very positive. I've learned a lot. I've made a lot of connections to established um, companies that have um, stellar supply diversity programs to companies that are actually were just starting off their program. So it was a good spot to be. I came in at a great time. I've met actually a, a ton of you at a, a couple of events. So I'm here to support and advocate and kind of move things along. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, some cool things that Anjanetta didn't mention. Uh, in 2019, um, Anjanetta was awarded the Excellence in Diversity and Inclusion Award from Gordon Foods for Canada. Um, she was also awarded the Supplier Diversity All Starts Award from the Minority Business News as the Rising Star Recognition. Um, and then, um, I, I think this was last year, um, Anjanetta received uh, an honorable mention at the Best of the Best Diversity and Inclusion Award. Uh, even by NGLCC. Um, so um, only two years at um, Barilla, well, point two, three years at Barilla, but uh, making remarkable um, impact here um, in this part of our city space. And so um, we're glad to have you and look forward to all the many good things that you're going to um, accomplish. Um, so um, some folks don't realize that we had the opportunity to hear from both of you back in September um, to let us know that you, you know, were working on a relationship um, and really at that point, just trying to figure out what opportunities were. And so uh, we'll love to um, hear from, from both of you, um, sort of just an update on what the relationships look, looks like now and just what you guys are working on. And Jeanette, you want to go first? Okay, sure. Um, I met Ryan um, probably at the, my second event. Um, being a, a representative from Barilla, um, partner with Chamber. I met him at a, the second event. He introduced himself. Um, he told me what he did. I told him what I did. We kind of had some small talk. And of course, we exchanged cards. And I'm like, go register. He's like, okay, I'm going to go register. Great seeing you. We met again at another event. And I'm like, oh my God, Ryan, did you register? We talked about registration. And then we started to kind of talk about other stuff family, news, uh, just kind of just dialoguing, right? Two people that's kind of reconnecting, reconnecting, reconnecting. So eventually um, that kind of led us to um, me scheduling a um, supplier introduction. So initially I was trying to introduce uh, Ryan to our packaging uh, buyers because like um, it was mentioned, um, the Ruskin Group has been around for hundreds of years. It's a privately owned family company. Guess how long Barilla has been around? Guess what the ownership status of Barilla? So being able to kind of align with companies that have been around, right? They evidently know the space. They're offering packaging products. You know, I think this would be a good introduction for me to get this company in front of our buyer. So we did that. I, I brought in all the stakeholders. We had a great meeting. We teleported in um, two of our plant managers to kind of uh, uh, get information and kind of get insight on the organization, tons of question asked across the room and across the table. And then someone on Ryan's team mentioned the sustainability piece. So I also, I do supply diversity and sustainability. So of course things kind of perked up. So we had tons of conversation around sustainability, sustainable packaging, some of the new technology that they were coming out with. And actually the direction kind of went from packaging to more to sustainability. So it was a lot of conversation and a lot of dialogue and a lot of interest from our plants as it relates to waste uh, management, recycling. Um, so there was a, a lot of dialogue and a lot of traction that kind of took place. Um, so the stage that we're at now was uh, follow-up meetings. So a lot has happened kind of since that time frame. but I actually reached out to Ryan, I don't know, maybe a month or two ago because what I wanted to do was kind of get his information and kind of get him prepared for um, next level conversations, meetings, um, and interactions with the folks at the plant. So from my perspective, I think the things were kind of like in, in my plate on my court, 
Um, so Ryan, if you want to chime in and kind of give some insight as to relate to how we got to that part and kind of what you were thinking as we were kind of trying to get to that, get to that part. Sure, happy to. Um, great description. Uh, it's it's been a quick journey over the last two years. We actually met before we met. Um, uh, Anjanette had just started, um, and uh, the Chicago Botanic Garden, whose board I serve on, had a um, sustainability, a corporate sustainability program at our new farm on Ogden, um, on the west side, where we are doing urban agriculture. Uh, we're teaching. Um, urban agriculture, farming, um, sustainable uh, practices to folks on the west side of Chicago. It's a really cool place. Um, and uh, we happened to sit next to each other at that meeting and, um, and didn't know that we were gonna have the opportunity to work together in this way. So, so one of the lessons learned um, from that experience is um, come to Jeremy's events, come to the, the chamber events uh, and participate, um, but also look for other events. And, and the chamber does a great job of coordinating with other organizations that are focused on supplier diversity, on sustainability, on other aspects of your business that and your product offering that um, you never know who you're gonna meet. And Chicago is really a two degrees of separation kind of a city. Um, and that's what makes the city and the, and the community work so well in Chicago. So. Um, so we started our initial relationship at a place that had nothing to do with supplier diversity. It was just sustainability. And then when I realized that Anjanetta wears two hats that are the two hats that are what we what we do today, which is sustainable packaging and supplier diversity, um, it was a terrific fit. And as she mentioned, we've had some great meetings. We've talked to a lot of people, and there are so many ways that we can work together. That the challenge for both of us is to prioritize and to figure out um, where do we start. Where where do we, you know, in large complex organizations like Barilla, you might find that the best opportunity for us, for example, to make um, boxes for pasta isn't for two years because that program's under a three-year contract. So that might not be the best place to start. So we're gonna look at um, waste management and sustainable practices on recycling packaging within one of the plants potentially. Um, but when we met in September, that you guys were piloting a project on the waste management side at the plant too. So it's all about being in the right place at the right time. Um, and it's so important to check in with each other periodically and say, what's new? What do you guys have that's new? What's, what's, what's working for you? What's not on both ends? Um, because the quotes, the, the, the life cycle of a relationship can be something that uh, I can help somebody with tomorrow, or it could be literally three to five years down the road. And, um, and that's how you have to think about these relationships and that's where we are with Barilla where there's a lot of opportunity and we just have to continue to figure out um, what what's next and 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 where there's good momentum on both sides. Awesome thank you so much for that uh, and definitely it is so interesting how sometimes we meet people in random places and you just never know how those faces or those names just come back around and so um, as, Ellen, as Ellen says be kind you just never know. <laughs> Um, so for, just to um, maybe just take a step back, Ryan. Um, so obviously, you know, we just heard that um, your company is 126 years old, um, but you've now been certified for I think about, you said maybe two to three years or so. Um, so can you tell us just what was the reason that led you to get certified? And if you recall, what were maybe some of the mistakes that you made early on in your process? What did you think certification was when you initially got certified? Um, great questions. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we've been part of the chamber um, since the early 2000s. We attended, I think, maybe the second or third conference in San Francisco um, because I was in a, a senior leadership role at our company at the time. Um, after going to graduate school, I went to work for a consulting firm here in town for AT Kearney for several years in supply chain and operations uh, before going back to work with my family business. Um, and when I started back with the business, I was in some operational roles and I realized that I had the opportunity to begin a transformation of our organization inside and out from our, our suppliers to our employees, to our customers, to being more diverse and inclusive. Um, 
because that was not a characteristic of our company when I started. Uh, as a traditional manufacturing Midwestern company, um, I can't say that our industry as a whole or our company individually had leadership roles in the supplier diversity movement. And I absolutely wanted to start to change that as quickly as I could. Um, and uh, so that's what brought me to the National Chamber was here was an organization getting off the ground doing good work on LGBT supplier diversity, um, which is one part of the puzzle because we're also committed to women and other minority diversities, uh, diversity programs uh, across all different categories. Um, so I started participating with the Chamber, even though I couldn't be certified because I didn't meet the requirements of being 51% owned and operated. So, um, so the, the lesson I learned there was, even if you're not ready to be certified, you can easily and should engage with the local and national chamber because they're certainly there for you. You can also engage with chambers that might not be your demographic. There is nothing that says you can't participate in a women-owned um, supplier diversity event or an African-American owned supplier diversity event or whatever they are out there. Everybody's sort of happy to see each other um, because we're all playing in the same sandbox. And as um, our mayor taught us uh, at City Hall a few months ago, um, we are not competing with each other in supplier diversity. There is not a set amount of opportunity um, and one slice of a pie that will be divided up among all of us, it is the idea of growing the slices of the pie and growing the total pie for all of us. And she very eloquently and very directly addressed those criticisms at City Hall. So um, I applaud her for taking that bold step. Um, so that was one of the lessons I learned, which is just get started, just get involved with the organization, even if you're not certified. We became certified the minute the transaction, we started the process, the minute the transaction I closed with my, with my parents to take over ownership of the business. So the minute I had the legal paperwork to do that, I started to submit the process. So, um, so that's why uh, it took us a while uh, to, to get there, but it's also why we were engaged with the organization for a long period of time. Um, and uh, so that was, uh, you know, sort of one of the lessons that we learned, which is just get started, just get, get involved, just get engaged. There were people I was meeting at the, um, at the, at the national conventions that said, you can still register even if you don't have your certification yet. You can still start to participate and be open to potential supplier relationships, even without the certification. But what I've also found <clears throat> is that that certification is a game changer. That is, a, is, it adds legitimacy. It adds in some of the, the web portals and, and the <clears throat> ways you need to sign up for these uh, different uh, supplier initiatives you can't go further if you don't have a certification that you can check. So um, so I guess I'm saying two things. One is it was really helpful for us to just get out there and meet people and start the dialogue, but it was also equally, if not more important to get certified because that just took our opportunities to another level. So those were definitely some of our uh, early uh, lessons that we learned through the process. Good. Uh, one thing I forgot to do um, is to I have a short poll um, that I'm going to send out here. So we'll take some feedback from everyone on today's um, call. So you should see the questions. <coughs> um, if we could, um, I'm going to ask our corporate folks to avoid answering this question. Um, so just our small business folks, if you'll answer this for us. Um, if you will let us know which certification you have. Um, how many employees do you have? And that does include yourself. Um, which industry best describes your business? Um, how many portals do you think you've signed up on? <laughs> um, and then just do you have your capabilities statement prepared? And Ryan, you did definitely make some good points there. Um, you know, we are partners with all the other certifying bodies here locally, um, including the uh, Chicago Minority Supplier Development Council, the Women's Business Development um, Council. Um, actually, one of our participants on today's call, um, Jason, Mama Clay, and Andrew with Fuzzy, Log Fuzzy Logic, um, just completed um, one of the programs at the WBDC. So um, definitely there is great opportunity for everyone to engage with all of those organizations. 
So, yeah, I mean, at a, at a minimum, <laughs> we put all those links on our uh, web pages and on our sites too, so that um, anytime we come across a something that's that's relevant in supplier diversity at all, we make sure that that becomes part of our internal and external communications plan. So um, <clears throat> it's a great way to help build the networks. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna share the results just so everyone sees. Um, so most of our folks are LGBT BEs with a couple of MBEs, a WBE, and um, some other certifications mixed in there. Most folks are in the two to 10 employee size. Um, but a couple that are in the 26 plus, so that's exciting. Most folks here are in the marketing, communications, creative services, but some other folks who um, have some other industries not listed here as well. Um, let's see. I'm excited to see that uh, most of you are in the more than 10 portals um, uh, response. And we're about half and half in terms of those capability statements. And so, um, okay. So I'll, with that, I'll send our next question to um, Anjanetta. So you see here that about half and half of today's guests have, you know, 50% of, uh, half of them have the capability statements. Um, can you talk to sort of the importance of folks having this document together? Any other documents that you, um, Look, to look for or just other companies. What um, what what statements? What documents should folks have prepared, and why are these things so valuable? Okay, so you you pretty much nailed it. The um, a very important document to have ready and prepared is the capabilities uh, statement. A lot of times when we when we, when we can eventually go back outside, right, and we you know go to trade shows and things. Um, Business cards are helpful, but your capability statement is even more helpful because once you go to our, our site and you register in portal, you can upload that capability statement. What I usually try to do when I come from a trade show is go through the information, people that have registered, look at their capability statements, check out their website, check and see um, buyers. Sometimes they, I have lists of things that they're gonna be procuring for or contracts that could be expiring and to see if I can make some introductions. The buyers are very busy, right? So for me to get time with them, I need something of substance to say, hey, I've got this supplier that I think, you know, maybe, you know, would you mind taking a look at? Do you mind giving some feedback on it? Do you want a, a supplier introduction? So if I have that capability statement, I don't get asked all the questions around what are the capabilities, what type of technology, what type of services. Everything is listed on that capabilities document. Now, if there's something outside of the capabilities document, then that's great because that means that the buyer is taking time to read the information, digest it. And if they have additional questions now, you know what, let me just set up a call with the supplier so we can kind of have that dialogue. So the capability statement is a very important document. I think a website that people can go to because we're all at our computers, right? So the first thing that anybody does is they'll Google somebody or they'll go to their website. So um, capability statement is important. Having a website is important. And the other documents would be anything to help support you responding to an RFP or an RFQ. So, but a lot of those documents you, you should already have. Um, so, but the big thing for me was the capability statement because I've got something tangible to either email or walk over and say, hey, take a look at this supplier. So that kind of helps me start the conversation and dialogue with the buyer. Jeremy, do you have examples um, of some great capability statements that you can that we can post to the website or share around? Because um, we some sometimes when we meet with with folks um, at the national convention, they have that. But um, you know, I, we don't have a standard template out there. Um, but it would be really helpful if we had a couple templates, you know, as guidelines for everybody. Um, because sometimes it's very daunting to sit with a blank sheet of paper and say. What am I going to say? And um, and the buyers will do a good job of telling you the information they need. And that's why I encourage everyone to go to the national conventions because there will be workshops on these types of topics where um, you know they'll have people from big companies that will say, "This is all the information I need," and we take notes and then we make sure we put that into our document. Um, but what's great is that you know. 
Ann Janetta can tell you exactly the type of information that her buyers and that she, her organization needs, and she's the consumer of it. Um, and so we take our lead from our customers or potential customers on that, as opposed to letting our folks try to figure out. And we do the same with our website, because a lot of times when you design a website, you want to tell your story and you want to tell everybody what you think they need to know about you. Whereas um, what you really want to know is what are the people that are coming to your site need? What's the information? So we ask our customers, um, what are the things that, that you need to know about us um, when you visit our site? And first and foremost is what do you do? What do you make? Um, where do you do it? So locations, contact information. How many of you have been to a website where you can't get to an email address? It's like fill out this form and then um, it, you, you just assume it goes into a black hole and nobody ever gets back to you. Um, I think it's so important to have some sort of contact vehicle for people to reach out to you in multiple ways, phone, email, form. Um, we have a form on our website, uh, uh, but we also have other ways to be reached and um, and we have a 24 hour guaranteed response to everything that comes that's not spam to that form. Um, and I can't tell you how many times people say, I can't believe I heard from you. We just assume when we fill out those forms, it goes into a black hole, but, um, but use your current customers and potential customers and folks like Anjanetta and, and others that are in the, that are already in our, our, our orbit to tell you what they need. Uh, as opposed to trying to think about what what they what you think they need, um, and uh, and then I find the process is much more efficient use of time and resources. That's a great great point, and also one thing that I wanted to to piggyback on is um, the capability statement uh, template. So I've got some few, so I would like to get with you on that, Jeremy, because I think that would be helpful, right? So we can definitely provide that. Perfect. Um, I was going to say that's an easy, we could definitely do that. And so, um, the Janetta for helping us with that part. Um, so Ryan, you were just talking about sort of, you know, the client piece and sort of, you know, how, you know, how you decide what information is going to be shared. Um, can you tell us a little bit about sort of your um, sort of research or prospecting process? Um, how do you determine if um, a company is the right one for you to be um, going after? Um, so obviously, you know, um, there are many companies that might need, you know, biodegradable sort of um, items, but how do you, what do you look at to really know this is the thing that needs me? I'm going to be a good candidate for them. What does that process look like for you? So for us, it's a, it's a little frustrating sometimes because we do offer so many different things. We have a custom packaging um, capability where we can design and build packaging to anybody's specifications that has their brand on it, their logos, their information. We can do it in plastics and paper and all sorts of different substrates. So within that side of our business, there's a ton of different opportunities to work with companies uh, that are part of the, the supplier diversity network. On the other side of our business, our stock packaging and shipping supplies business. Um, anyone can go to our e-commerce website and order. They can order five moving boxes or a truckload of moving boxes, or they can order stretch wrap and shrink film and 25,000 other SKUs. And so, um, but that part of our business is sort of very hands-off. I don't need to have our staff involved in that part. So unlike some companies that just make one thing and do it really well or offer one particular service, we offer a lot. So prioritization is a challenge for us because we don't have unlimited resources. So for us, we often look at, um, we start with the most basic tool uh, you can possibly have for business or for life in general, which is the, the old two by two matrix of on one axis, you, process, you, you plot, um, you know, potential size and impact, you know, is it a is it always going to be a little small company on the left or is it or could it grow to be a large, uh, you know, long term relationship on the right. And then the second access, the, the vertical access is ease of implementation. How easy is it to make that happen? Um, and you want to focus, uh, for us, we focus our efforts on the, the first box, um, which is the easiest implement with the biggest impact. That's where we sort of try to focus most of our initiatives, knowing that the hardest to, Im the, the hardest to implement with the smallest potential returns is the thing that we probably never get to. 
Um, and we try to have a lot of discipline around that. And it's tough sometimes because sometimes you don't know exactly where to plot somebody on those two axes. Um, and sometimes something comes in and it looks really exciting and it's sort of the shiny new thing that gets waved in front of you and all of a sudden we run off chasing the shiny new thing without thinking about how easy will it be and what resources are required um, and what's the potential impact to the business. Um, and so, you know, we have to fight every day that impulse to chase the shiny new thing. And so that's, that's been a challenge for us um, and for everybody, because you know, none of us are big public companies where we have unlimited resources, where we can go to some sort of manager and say, Hey, I've got this great new opportunity. So I need 10 new salespeople and I need to put new equipment in and do all of these things. That's not traditionally how most of our uh, companies run, we have to make trade-offs every day as to where do we spend our time. And, um, and so that's, that's a, an ongoing challenge that we have every day. And there are many other ways that we slice our, our potential customer um, opportunities and data, but we find that, um, you know, because there's ways to look at complexity, at financial impact, at use of resources. There's all other ways, but but the most basic is how easy is it is is it to work with them and turn them into a customer, um, versus what's the impact going to be on our bottom line organization. Great, thank you so much, Brian. Um, so I'd love to start taking questions from you all, and so I have a, I have obviously more questions I've been asked. So I'm gonna, I have a question now, and then um, I see that. Jason sent me a question, so I'll ask that question next. Uh, but Anjanetta, um, so, um, you know, you know, we heard Ryan talk a little bit earlier about um, how they've made a shift in um, starting to provide um, PPP, uh, PPE items. Um, so, um, so, of course, their business has been impacted in one way in terms of the services box for now, helping people connect to. Um, can you tell us about um, how um, the current situation is impacting Barilla, um, how this is impacting your supply chain, and particularly at this time um, when certified companies are coming to you to, to try to be a partner, um, how can we? How can businesses most be helpful at this moment? What um, what should they be coming to you with solutions to? Um, what what are what are the opportunities? Okay, that was like one, two, three, about like five questions. <laughs> there were a lot of questions, all in one. Pick, pick one of the questions and you can answer. Okay, so uh, first of all, so um, our company has experienced what every other company um, has experienced across the the company. Um, the good thing is that we were just able. We just we're able to kind of execute uh, contingency plans that we've already had in place. Um, so that was a good thing as it re relates to remote work and uh, video conferences and sharing um, remotely, we've already kind of had those uh, practices kind of uh, in place. Um, so it was just a matter of flipping a switch to have it executed uh, company-wide so that we can continue with business continuity um, as, as usual. So the same things that every other organization is finding um, impacting them as it relates to um, not being able to meet, um, not being able to gather um, PPE, of course. So the big thing that we were concerned about as an organization is um, employee safety. safety. So making sure that all of our families are okay. Is everybody okay? And then once we figure out that families are okay, then how are we gonna operate? So there were plans and procedures in place, whether it be a tornado or a, a earthquake happens, to kind of figure out business continuity. So we're impacted just like all the other uh, companies across uh, the US are impacted. Um, ways that um, you're right. So the company has kind of shifted and kind of looked at, okay, um, things operational critical, right? So right now suppliers that are reaching out to me about selling me um, promotional items, uh, trade show stuff, things that right now we kind of shifted to operational critical. So um, things that are critical for businesses, for us, we're a food company, would be raw ingredients. So that's kind of where our focus is on shifting and trying to reach out and touch suppliers that are um, can help kind of support our supply chain in that way. So with any organization, when you're contacting them about your products or services, you know, try to think about, well, what would this business, um, try to understand what things are impacting them now. Right, so you trying to reach out at a time when, you know, to sell things that might not be business critical 
might not be a, a good time to kind of reach out other than kind of registering with the portal. But if you have a solution, um, some services or some products that you feel could help us kind of move to the next level or kind of elevate things that we're doing, then of course, those are the type of suppliers that we want to kind of see and kind of um, give some time to. Um, but also during this time, because people have time, right? We're all at home, we're multitasking, we're doing all those things that we didn't have time to do because we were chasing carrots, or as Ryan would say. So a lot of suppliers are reaching out um, with PPE, with all, things that we wouldn't have never thought of. And as the information is coming into me, I'm filtering it and I'm trying to relay the information that I think would make sense, given the, the timing and kind of where our uh, crucial uh, needs and operational uh, 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 focus is right now. We're laying that information to the buyers for those commodities or services. Um, so we're doing everything we can do to remain compliant with all local and federal, you know, guidelines. And, you know, so, so far we're taking it one day at a time and we are continuing to do what we do. As you can see, I'm on this webinar uh, because diversity and inclusion um, is still important. The work will not stop. So I don't know if I've answered all your questions, but. Yeah, that was good. That was perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so we've got two questions that have been submitted. And so um, I will unmute you, Jason, so you can ask the question. Or you can unmute. Okay. Great. All right, awesome. Hey there, everyone. Hi there, Anjanetta, Ryan. Thank you for spending the time and good to see you again. Um, hopefully you guys remember us as the name tag folks, even though that's not our primary line of business. Um, uh, uh, once again, my name is Jason Mamaclay. Pronouns are he, him, his. And uh, I'm one of the two owners of Fuzzy Logic Escape Room. Uh, you really hit the nail on the head on kind of the heart of my question, um, but I'll still take a stab at asking about it anyway. Uh, so uh, for yourself, as well as anyone else who may be responsible for supplier diversity, given the current economic and climate, I imagine that there has been kind of a net negative impact in amounts of available spend, or at least a focusing on what that spend looks like. Um, how has that impact affected the focus on supplier diversity and how much pie is available and what slice of the pie that we're seeing diverse suppliers being able to grab um, because it's possible that maybe there's more of a percentage that's spent on supplier diversity because there are certain set number of dollars that are going to certain companies that provide these types of essential services. So where have you seen the impact of COVID affecting supplier diversity conversations because the manner in which money is being spent or where it's being focused is rapidly changing? Great question. Um, with our organization, we don't have any set aside money for any particular groups. Um, what we, we evaluate diverse suppliers just like we do any other type of supplier. And actually that's one thing that we're trying to, 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 to get better at is it's supplier management. It's not just supplier diversity, it's supplier management. So uh, diverse suppliers are going through the same process that uh, any other supplier that is going through that comes through our supply chain. So. Um, what I see happening is that when we look at kind of where, I don't know if you guys, did you guys look at the poll that Ryan put up? Just from our, the call, a lot of our um, diverse suppliers are in marketing, a lot of our diverse, so depending on, thank you for the categorization, cate categoriz ugh, categorization of where our diverse suppliers fall, kind of dictates the areas that, um, coincide to where the need of our operation is, right? So if we need suppliers, we, we, we buy wheat, right? So that's a big commodity for us. If I don't have any diverse suppliers that can participate in procuring wheat, then you know there's no dollars that's gonna be allocated to that um, supplier. Um, so it kind of depends on operational needs and kind of where we can find some type of alignment with a diverse supplier that is uh, established that is capable because right now we're at a point where we can't we can't try something right now, right? So we can't try something that's gonna kind of impact the business. So we are still business as usual. We're not excluding anybody from participating. Um, anytime that I get information about what we're gonna buy, where we're gonna buy it, I'm searching database. I'm doing really nothing has changed about my role. However, there's certain commodities and um, services that we won't be buying be due to the climate that we're in. Does that 
kind of makes sense. I feel like I'm answering. Yeah, no, that's that's an absolutely great focus for that. The big takeaway that I'm receiving from that is basically um, be where the clients need you to be essentially. And that's where you're going to be able to find success. Um, and I uh, just recognize that there are going to be some areas that are less sought after because of a need for focus during this time. You got it. Yeah. I mean, what we're, what we're seeing on our end in that respect is that a full blown supplier diversity initiative might be put on hold because of resource allocation, um, you know, to look at a particular item or category. But on the other hand, um, we are getting outreach from companies that we have a relationship with, but we're not selling them product right now necessarily, but they know who we are, um, looking for things in our categories. This is why being registered on their websites are so important. And I'll give you one example is um, there's a shortage right now of global trash bags. Um, and so uh, because a lot of that product had been shifted to Southeast Asia production um, over the last several years because the costs were so much lower. Um, and so a lot of big companies switched to procuring from, from that supply chain. And because of all of the COVID-19 reasons of those factories converting to other products because of demand, um, increase in demand globally, all sorts of, of factors with shipping product overseas, we had a, a, a major national um, retailer come to us saying, um, hey, you know, you're in our supplier database. We're actually there because of our supplier diversity registration with them. And they said, any chance you have any stock of any of these domestic uh, trash bags that you can get us or can get us them pretty quickly. So there's an opportunity where because of the situation we're in with a company we're not currently working with, but because we're part of their system and we exist, um, we may have a really big opportunity uh, initially and maybe we can roll that into something more long-term. Um, so we are seeing that. Uh, I also encourage everyone to look at sites to register on like Ariba, for example, Ariba Sourcing, which is a, a global uh, platform where people can um, post requests for all sorts of different kinds of, of products. And um, there's different levels. You can, I think there's a free account, there's a paid, there's all sorts of different ways to be a supplier on Ariba. But one of the things that, that I'm sure you guys all experience that we do is that um, almost every company um, that, that you wanna work with has their own portal their own registration process, their own forms. Um, and so it can be unbelievably overwhelming to fill out all this information multiple times, slightly differently. So the best way to handle that on your end, from our perspective is keep a file of all of those documents that you can then just adjust and tweak. But better yet, if you register on sites like Ariba, where you put all that information in once and that and then anybody that wants to work with you has a base set of information, then you don't, in theory, have to do it a hundred times over. So, um, so there's a couple other sites like Ariba. I'll think of those and, and get those out to you through um, Jeremy. But, um, but that's one that comes to mind that we get requests every day from. And sometimes we look at it and we say, um, you know, 75% of those requests aren't a good fit um, for one reason or another, but every once in a while, there's something that is a great fit. And, um, and so it's, it's, it's a good, you know, sort of um, prospecting tool. Okay. Phenomenal yeah. guidance, phenomenal story. Thank you. Awesome. So we do have another question. Uh, so Jennifer, uh, are you, oh, there you go. Um, so I'm going to unmute you. Uh, okay. You want to share? I have uh, two questions. Two questions. One is, um, I'm a small company just starting, just recently was certified. I'm also a certified veteran on business, and I am filling out the 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 um, you know the applications through the different portals. Um, the capability statement comes. Up, sorry, the, cap the capability statements comes up in um, several of them, and. I'm just, because I'm small, I, I look at some examples and I get really intimidated about what can I put on mine and how is this gonna be viewed? Like, am I just gonna be slamming the door in my own face if I have this weak looking capability statement because I'm a growing company? And so that's the first, com how, how should I approach that capability statement? And the second question is I'm actually, um, Barilla is one of my customers now 
and I'm lucky enough to have that relationship with Barilla, but they don't necessarily know that I'm certified now. So I want to kind of go through the back door and say, hey, by the way, I now I'm certified because um, um, just to let them know. And my contacts might necessarily not be the right ones for letting them know because I do re electronic recycling. Um, so uh, that was that's my two questions, like how should I go about um, reintroducing myself to the company and then uh, the capability statement. Okay, so Jennifer, what is the name of your company again? Responsible Electronic Recycling. Okay, so the uh, reintroduction, um, I can definitely take care of on my end. And I actually, there should be some Barilla folks online um, we have a new, well, she, I can't even call her new anymore. Uh, Deanna Henry, she's our uh, new indirect uh, purchasing manager. We also have a new director. I think he's online, Giuseppe Mora. So I can definitely uh, facilitate the um, reintroduction. So thank you for being a supplier to Barilla. Congratulations on your certification. So I definitely wanna talk more kind of about what you've been doing and um, um, so that part, okay, we can take care of that part. As it relates to the capability statement, I think that um, it is what it is at this point in your uh, business uh, life cycle. You're just starting up. So I think that we can definitely put together some creative ways to kind of put your capability statement that it makes sense to talk about your strengths, your weaknesses, the value you add. And a lot of times what we also want to know, what we're interested in is what else, right? Other than selling me widgets, what else? You know, um, as it relates to what else do you care about? What else can you align with other companies around? So as uh, Ryan kind of pointed out, not only do they do packaging, they do responsible, sustainable, things of that sort. So there's other things that you can right. fill your capability statement with that can be attractive and um, tell your story. Okay, thank you I very agree. much. I agree. And I would just add, Jennifer, that, um, you know, always try to, we try to find ways to make, you know, potential competitive weaknesses strengths. Um, and in our industry, we're considered a small company because we compete with multi hundred million dollar and billion dollar companies every day that are much bigger. And one of the ways that we position ourselves um, is that um, as a small company in our space, and which you guys are too, um, the benefit is that you get me and us, and you get 100% um, access to the best people at the company 24-7. You know, people literally, they have my cell phones, they can call me. I'm not handing them off to somebody um, that, you know, may not have the skill set that they need. So that, um, and they also know that anybody in our organization, because we're small, um, is also going to be the best at whatever they are doing for our company. And so, um, so that level of commitment, and while you may think this company might be afraid that if they work with me, you know, I, I might not be here, you know, the, I, they might be too big a company for me, you know, if I'm doing, you know, $2 million in sales, and they want to give me a million dollar account, that might be too much risk for them. Um, you know, again, the way to spin that around, because we've, we've encountered that several times, too, is to say, um, we, it's important for our customers to be considered a top 10 customer with us. Um, and quite frankly, um, they're going to be a top 10 customer with you um, and somebody, one of your competitors, they might not even be a top 100 customer. And so I think finding creative ways to talk about these aspects as being real strengths, it's not going to resonate with anyone. Somebody may have a corporate policy that says we cannot be more than 10% of, of one of our supplier's revenues. There's nothing you can do about that. But for people that don't have that policy, um, we find that by selling us as individuals and us as, as our capabilities and expertise and having guaranteed access to that is, is how we position ourselves in the market. Okay. Well said. Um, so I want to, um, we might go over a few minutes. I'd like to give everyone the opportunity to just do a very short introduction um, before we go. Um, so hopefully you can 
hang on for about two more minutes. And Janetta, um, I need to get some of the folks here if you do have to go, so I know that they can also um, access information. Um, but I will um, ask both of you um, this final question, and then we'll open it up to everyone to just do a very, very short introduction of who they are. Um, well, I'll ask, I'll ask two questions, and both of you can decide which one you want to answer. Um, so one question is, um, so uh, how can suppliers just set, them, set themselves apart? Um, Ryan, you kind of just talked about that um, in your response to Jennifer. Um, so how can I really set myself to be different, stand out from everyone else? And then the other question is, of course, you know, um, we tend to think about um, using supplier diversity on the certification for um, to do contracts directly with um, companies like Barilla. Um, but we'll love for someone to speak just very briefly to um, sort of the tier two uh, B2B component of supplier diversity and the benefits of uh, engaging in that way as well. I don't know if anyone's more excited to answer either one of those questions. Okay, um, so as it relates to a uh, tier two supplier, we actually had this conversation, um, I think on Monday with Giuseppe. Um, we don't have a, uh, we haven't formalized a, a tier two program yet, um, as you all have heard. So we're actually going into our third year of the program. So we're actually trying to just get the foundation set, get all the policies, procedures, processes, put our tier one down, get our reporting down, and then let's kind of elevate to uh, tier two. The reason that we are interested in setting up our tier two program is so that we can have partnerships with our current suppliers, our prime suppliers, our big suppliers, um, to ensure that they understand how important diversity and inclusion is to Barilla. So we're gonna be reaching out to our top uh, suppliers and saying, hey, do you have a supplier diversity program? Two, uh, here are some of the things that are important to us. Three, we want you to start participating and sharing in that inclusion effort with us by reporting to us who you're doing business with. So let me give, there's one example that I wanna use. So um, in the event of our, our raw materials, we very rarely are able to find somebody that can kind of, that is certified that can kind of provide us those um, commodities. Well, what we were able to do through a relationship was say, hey, um, they were able to kind of go out and look at some suppliers and because they knew that supplier diversity was important to us, our prime supplier added in a metric with their RFP and RFQ uh, process that asked the question about uh, diversity and inclusion, was anybody certified? And at the end of the day, when, when all things are equal, quality, service, capabilities, and somebody is certified, it kind of adds and kind of gives a little bit more leverage. And the, our tier one supplier wind up awarding the business to that diverse supplier. So tier two programs are very important. And it's another way for us to kind of uh, support businesses that we can't possibly do business with for whatever reason. But it's also a way for us to kind of hold our uh, top suppliers accountable to diversity and inclusion in their supply chain as well. I think sort of what Engina said also sort of speaks to, and, or another thing that Brian said earlier is, the, the importance of going to the other peer organizations, events, and activities. Um, definitely, for sure, um, there are, you know, people who are certified as you know, WBE, uh, MBE, who are needing additional people to work with and partner with them on contracts to be able to win those opportunities. And so definitely where you can partner with folks who have other um, certification um, backgrounds, um, even if it is still just LGBT, but definitely where you can partner with other diverse backgrounds, um, you're really helping um, Barilla um, really be able to um, communicate more clearly its impact on supply diversity. So definitely um, really pay attention to building relationships with other diverse suppliers from other backgrounds and certifications. Uh, Ryan, I'm, I'm assuming you want to answer that um, set us apart question for us. Yeah, on on the, the question of, of tier one and tier two, um, we've rarely had opportunities where tier one suppliers have come to us and ask us to be a tier two. What's happened more with us is um, we may be going uh, to a potential customer where um, we're, we have a vendor of ours um, who's going to be supplying the ultimate product um, who 
is a tier one, uh, and then we would act as tier two or vice versa, where because of supplier diversity, we have the opportunity to create and manage and own that relationship and bring a much larger company than us. Uh, certainly like in the plastic space, we work with a company called Polyair, for example, and they're a global multi-billion dollar company, but we end up being the tier one um, for them, uh, as opposed to us being a tier two supplier to them. So, um, so we've had that experience occasionally. Um, on the question of, of differentiation and positioning, um, you know, I think what what comes what comes up a lot and what, what this a lot comes down to on our end is is a question of values. Is that we by being a diverse supplier by by living that as a company value with our employees and our suppliers, um, that creates alignment with our potential customers uh, that our competitors that are not diverse suppliers um, don't sort of automatically get. And so we find that uh, it's it's healthy to have conversations about that, about what are our company values and, and sharing those values because um, it's core to what we do and who we are. It's, it's sort of the why as, as to have why we exist in many cases. And, um, and it's not, it, what's great is it's not political. It may end up ultimately being translated that way. Um, I always have to, when there's an opportunity, um, you know, mention my biggest competitor in the packaging supplies business, which is Uline, because just yesterday, Liz Uline was quoted by saying she's launching a recall event to recall the um, governor of Wisconsin for his stay in place orders um, because she doesn't believe in them. And Uline is a $7 billion packaging company. So um, she clearly uh, is unapologetic about her very political values. Um, which we don't do because our view is we want to be a place for everybody to work, to supply products to us and to buy products from us, regardless of your political philosophy, as long as you share our corporate values, which are things that include supplier diversity, diversity, inclusion, equity, accessibility, all of these kinds of things that um, are core to who we are. And so that's really when you talk, Jeremy, about differentiators, that I think is a major differentiator for all of us versus our, our competitors out there. Thank you so much. Um, huge thank you, Ryan and Anjanetta, for joining us. Um, if you could, if both of you, you may have done this already, but if you would put your email address um, in the chat sections in case anyone wants to reach out to you guys for more um, questions or details. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Um, so what we're going to do very quickly is give everyone the opportunity to just do a quick introduction of themselves. Um, being that we are um, past time, I am going to be a stickler for a 30 second intro. And so um, if you do it, I am just going to put you on mute. Um, so please don't pick it. Um, don't pick it hard. I'm just trying to give you your time back. Um, so we are going to um, start with our first person um, on the screen, which is um, our awesome Chris and Gary. As soon as I find my timer. So when this, when the screen looks crazy, your time is up. <laughs> All right, thank you. Make sure I'm muted. Hi, uh, my name is Christopher Singeri. Uh, my company is Events with a K. Chris with a K, Events with a K. We are a custom event planning agency. Um, what we do, the way we differentiate ourselves is that my background was in marketing. I worked in retail promotional marketing before starting my business actually 10 years ago this month. Um, and so we look at events as not just any, as an extension of a company's uh, marketing plan. So that's who we are. And I think the screen is going crazy. So Chris and Gary, events with a K. Thank you. Chris, be sure to drop your email address in the comment section as well. Everyone else, when you introduce yourself, do uh, drop your email, our website, whatever it is the best uh, thing for you to have that. Uh, so Jennifer, uh, we will, if it will unmute. Can you unmute yourself? It is not with me. There we go. Okay. Okay, again, my name is Jennifer Leone. I'm a 
My company's responsible electronic recycling and we provide safe, secure, zero landfill recycling and certified data destruction to organizations with computer and office equipment. We're a social enterprise and provide job training and meaningful employment to adults with disabilities while providing our customers peace of mind that unwanted equipment is being properly taken care of. Our website is recycle-help.com. And my, again, my name is Jennifer. I really enjoyed the session today. Thank you. So very much for Jennifer. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm Don, we'll move on to you. Hi, Don Streppick here. I'm the owner and president of Tucker Inc. Fine Jewelry in downtown Chicago. I know you can't get to me right now, but if you're getting married or uh, have a special occasion, need a pair of earrings or necklace or anything else, please give me a holler. Nice seeing everyone. Thanks so much, Don. Um, uh, we'll move on to you. Great, thank you much. I'll take care of this on behalf of both Andrew and myself. Once again, Jason Mamaclay and Andrew Sandage, owners of Fuzzy Logic Escape Room, were providers of both in-person and soon to be virtual team building experiences that break through the digital screen and forge human connections in a time when we really need it as human beings. Um, FuzzyLogicEscapeRoom.com uh, and also provider of name tags. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. Okay. Break through the digital screen, there we have it. Uh, next, we're going to go to Dallas. Hey, everyone. I'm Dallas Golden, founder and executive director of Pond Ripple Media. We create video content for businesses, corporations, uh, organizations, and associations. Some of the stuff that we've done for the larger ones like Barilla and BP have been um, more of the safety videos that you would show to new employees. That's the kind of stuff that we also do, not just documentary style video. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, go to Patrick. And as of yesterday, Patrick is our newest certified business in Illinois. So congratulations, Patrick. Thanks, Jeremy. I can leave that out of my, my pitch. Uh, I am Patrick Crossan, owner and executive producer for PC Events and Experiences. I focus mainly on business to business events. Um, and I have also recently become a digital event strategist, um, getting that certification as well. So uh, pivoting really to virtual experiences and how to help people. Um, Jason, it's also good to see you. <laughs> um, but I'll drop my website in the chat. Much Patrick. Um, then we're gonna move on to Teresa. Hold on, hold on, hold on, we don't have any, hold on, hold on. Sorry. <laughs> there you go, there you go. Okay. I am here twofold, one to support Anjanetta, and um, two, because I'm very active in our Voce ERG, which is our LGBTQ um, ERG, and um, I really enjoy that, being that, you know, I'm just a human being, and I like to support others, and um, I love everything we do through our Voce, and I, um, I'm very active this year being a chairperson for the events. Um, hopefully that'll go on through next year too, since so many events were canceled this year. But anyway, thank you so much. I enjoyed this. I, uh, it was nice to actually take lunch and listen to this because a lot of times we just work through our lunch, which is not very smart. But anyway, congrats, Patrick, on your new certification too. Thank you so much, Teresa. Um, John, I'm going to unmute you now. for to share a quick introduction. Okay, we are going to move on to Deanna. Okay, Deanna. Hi, everyone. Um, I am, um, as Anjanetta stated, I am the indirect categories purchasing manager for Barilla. Um, looking forward to um, all of you who are certified and those who uh, seek to be certified to potentially join the Barilla network of suppliers. So um, very good meeting, very good presentations. Um, hope to see you all soon and good luck to all of you. Um, so again, I'm going to put a link back in the chat section to our May 28th um, spring uh, supplier diversity roundtable. 
Um, this will be a half day event um, where we'll have some really good education to um, develop and um, really provide some really next steps from this conversation that we had today. Um, again, today's conversation was really designed to give you some very basic one on one um, ideas and thoughts on how to be successful with this reputation that you have. Um, the event on May 28th, you'll really be able to dive more into some topics, um, as well as have the opportunity to tap into a prize. Um, traditionally, we award um, to business owners the opportunity to win um, travel and registration to go to the NGO season conference. Um, unfortunately, we just received notice that the conference will be canceled or postponed for this year. Um, so we are working on an alternative prize. Um, so we are excited to be able to bring that to you as well. Um, but you do have to be there to get the prize. And so um, I hope that all of you who are here today will be back with this day on May 28th for a chance to, uh, to get the prize. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us. Um, I don't know if Ryan or Anjanetta wanted to share anything before we signed off. Um. I would just like to um, encourage everyone to continue to do um, what you're doing as it relates to promoting your business, to networking. Now that everything is virtual, uh, make you know when time permits, if you can jump on uh, calls and participate in webinars, seminars, um, as we all kind of stated, whether it's LGBTQ or anything, right? Anytime that you have an opportunity to meet someone, introduce. Uh, that would be perfect. And your stuff does not go to black holes everywhere. So please register. That's our first line of support when I'm trying to introduce uh, buyers. And I always go to our database before I go externally, because I appreciate you taking the time and the consideration to want to do business with Barilla. Thank you. And can I say something, just one moment, if you don't mind? Sure. Uh, the mayor is just announcing that there's a new grant up to $5,000 for small businesses that might be in moderate to low income areas. So please go to the mayor's website. If you're in one of those neighborhood areas, please do it for yourself and bless you. I'm sharing that um, maybe tomorrow um, in our member email. So do be sure to be on the lookout for that. As Don said, it is mostly for communities that have, um, have some sort of impact. And so all the information will be laid up there. Ryan, did you have anything you wanted to add? I agree with Anjanetta. Great point. Um, you know, people have time now at home to, uh, you know, it might be, it might have been tough to get an in-person meeting with somebody, but uh, I found that people are at least more open to having a conference call and or a quick Zoom. So uh, if there are people that you've been trying to get in front of or have a conversation with, don't assume that the COVID-19 crisis uh, makes that harder. In some cases, it might be easier. Well, thank you all so much, and thank you for letting us have 15 minutes extra of your time. I know you're all busy people. Um, I hope that you have a great week. The rest of your day is productive, um, and I look forward to seeing all of you again on May 28th. And so um, have a good week, and see you all soon. Bye. Thank, thank you. Guys. Bye. Bye.